Um, you know, let's say you witnessed a car accident and an officer arrives on scene. They have to ask you questions. They have to ask you using words. And so they may ask, uh, how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other? Smashed can be replaced, let's say, with how fast were the cars going when they bumped into each other. You know, the verb that gets used turns out to have profound influence on uh, eyewitness reports. That research has been done. It's one of the classic early um, studies in this field. Smashed led to dramatically increased uh, estimates of speed, and it also led to false memory for broken glass on the scene. Um, that happened only because of how a question was framed. You can imagine if a more direct question is given, like, uh, was he wearing a blue sweatshirt? Um, or this other witness mentioned such and such, is it true? Um, or we found the gun at the scene, or you know, there are lots of different forms of uh, input that can very easily manipulate someone's memory. And then there's the ID procedure where there's lots of potential uh, forms of mischief. Um, and this does not require any malicious intent on anyone's part, it's just, uh, an area that we need to know enough about to be able to protect against. So let's start with let's start with the invitation to come to the precinct because there's going to be an ID procedure. If the officer says we have a suspect, <laughs> um, that's suggestive. It's going to incline a witness to go ahead and pick someone when maybe maybe they otherwise wouldn't have, or uh, you know it's just after a crime. The officer is interviewing you, and there's a radio call that a person was stopped around the corner, and so the person interviewing the witness says, uh, you know, there, there's someone who's been stopped. I'm going to put you in the back of the car. We'll go over there. We'll see if you can make an identification. You can identify him. So now it's not about, is this the right guy? It's about the witness's ability um, to make the identification. Again, suggestive. And this uh, lower one is actually similar to something I ran into about a week ago in a case that I was, uh, was, was serving as an expert on. Um, this actually is a, it's a paraphrase, but it came from a printed document that was part of standard procedure. The instruction up front, I will ask you if you recognize anyone in the array, then I will ask you who you recognize. <laughs> There's something suggestive about that. There's no reason to mention the who question until after there's an identification made, right? Um, and if, you met, you know, if you're being somehow trying to streamline or be efficient about the, the instruction process, you are biasing your witness. OK, if and when that strategy fails and you do not convince the, the trial court to abandon this test, um, at least the court should make Manson conform with the science, right? So let's talk about different ways that in which it could do that. So step one is the suggestiveness, uh, when it's looking at suggestiveness. You want to be explaining to the court why a particular witness is particularly su susceptible to suggestive, right? This is the whole thing about it not being a one-size-fits-all test. So. In order to do that, you want to convince the court that it needs to be looking at the strength and independence of the memory to begin with, right? In other words, look at the estimator variables and then explore how the suggestive system variables would interact with those estimator variables to further erode the reliability of the identification. So maybe they, uh, a sort of uh, suggestive identification procedure will increase the chances that they'll make a choice, that the eyewitness will make a choice. Or perhaps they'll increase the likelihood that your client is going to be chosen, right? So it's obviously going to be a case-by-case -case determination. Um, but you want to file a, a, a sort of a, a post-hearing motion, ideally, to explain the issues with the initial observations and the effect of the suggestive procedures given those initial observations. So use the science to do this. Try to use an expert who can assess the identification procedure for you um, and basically assume the court knows nothing. Right? You have to educate the court on all of this. OK, at step two of the test, um, when we are looking at the reliability factors, the court should only be looking at those factors that are scientifically sound and valid and objectively verifiable. And this analysis, again, 
uh, should account for the effects of suggestion on the factors. All right, so opportunity to view. So obviously, yes, you're gonna look at these traditional factors like distance and time and lighting and assess them in light of what the science actually tells us those things mean. But also, you want to be looking at things like cross-race identification, whether the uh, perpetrator was wearing a disguise. How well uh, can this particular eyewitness see? Were they intoxicated at the time? Um, in other words, these self-reports about opportunity to view have to be looked at in light of the science. Um, degree of attention. You want to counter claims of high attention with the research on the impact of stress and weapon focus, for instance, on your ability to do that, right? So someone might think they're paying a lot of attention, uh, but we know from the research that they may not be paying the kind of attention that they think they are. If it's a first ID procedure that happens in court, what we know, well, memory fades within minutes and hours, and a first-time ID at trial occurs within months, if not years, after the event. As a test of memory, it could not be more poorly designed, right? This is not how we would want a test of memory. In addition, um, eyewitnesses may have been primed in preparation for trial by, they could have seen photos in the media, they may have been prepped for, for this exact thing by the prosecution, by law enforcement. They may have been shown booking photos. They may have been, I mean, lots of other things may have happened. You may not have even gotten discovery. They may not have seen that as an identification procedure, but rather trial prep. Um, I don't know how all the discovery rules work in all of your jurisdictions, but I would take a guess that you're not getting all of the um, information that is shared with a witness um, in those trial prep meetings. It is very possible that witnesses are primed um, with photographs of your client uh, before going in for a first time ID. Um, it's certainly something to think about. Even if they're not, of course, um, it is not a great test of memory, but I think that there's a very good chance that they have um, seen your client in, in other forms. Um, with respect to a what I call a problematic out of court ID that has happened previously, well, uh, the prior procedure um, has contaminated the witness's memory. We talked about contamination. And um, the witness and the fact finder is not gonna be able to uh, understand how that contamination impacted the person's memory. They're not gonna know. And I'm talking about neither the witness nor the jury will be able to distinguish. Is the person, is the witness now recognizing the person in court from the ID procedure that happened before or from seeing them in court now? How can you possibly tell the difference, right? You don't know that. That's why you don't do multiple procedures because you can't tell, right? And the other problem with this middle category is that where you have a problematic prior procedure that has suggestiveness or where the witness was equivocal, um, and then you have this in-court ID that looks perfect, right? The, juror, the, the witness has, has no problem picking out the person. Um, the jurors tend to ignore any problems with the prior ID because they're not seeing that. So instead of focusing on the thing that may have been a test of memory, which is the thing that happened out of court, the jurors focus on, on this thing that has no probative value that's happening right in front of them. And that is, the, is a really big problem, is that they believe it's a test of memory and it substitutes for the thing that, while imperfect, was actually a better test of memory. So that's a really big problem. As far as the third thing, as I say, there's always a concern with repeated procedures, right? Because you can never tell who, whether you're recognizing the person from this procedure or the other one. But the thing that's at least better with the third one is that at least the person's memory is not contaminated by suggestiveness. Um, but in any case, there's always a problem with repeated procedures. Um, OK, so what do courts think? This is from a Massachusetts case where um, the court eliminated first time in court identifications. And um, 
the, the Massachusetts court says, the high court says, although the defendant's not alone, even a witness who has never seen the defendant will infer that the defendant is sitting with counsel at the defense table, can easily infer who's the defendant and who's the attorney. The presence of the defendant in the courtroom is likely to be understood by the eyewitness as confirmation that the prosecutor, as a result of the criminal investigation, believes that the defendant is the person who, com who the eyewitness saw commit the crime. And then here's the important part. Under such circumstances, eyewitnesses may identify the defendant out of reliance on the prosecutor and in conformity with what is expected of them rather than because their memory is reliable. So the court is saying, you know, this is not a test of memory, but just something that they're doing out of expectation, out of conformity. That's pretty significant, right? All right. So what about witness confidence, right? So we talked a lot today about you know, witness confidence is only related to accuracy when it's immediately, when it's tested immediately after a pristine procedure before there's any feedback, right? Okay, so, uh, well, when you have a first time ID, witness confidence is completely unrelated to accuracy because obviously it's not a pristine procedure, it's the furthest thing from it. Um, however, witness confidence is the thing that is most likely to be used by jurors as a proxy for accuracy in that moment. Um, you know that, obviously, from Ilona's story, from talking to jurors. You know that from common sense, um, although I hate that term. Um, but also, um, they have nothing else to go on. What else are they going to go on? Um, when you have a problematic prior procedure, um, or you have a witness who is equivocating before, you're very likely to get inflation. So like you have a witness who said, mm, I don't know, it could be him, 50-50, whatever, someone who wasn't sure. And by the time, and then at that point, the person who they were equivocating on ends up getting arrested, ends up getting charged, they go to trial. Well, by the time they get to trial, then they're damn sure. They may not even know that they equivocated before. They may, in fact, their memory may have, you know, they may believe in hindsight, I was sure before. Um, you know, lots of things can change. But by the time they get to trial, they're going to be sure. 